something to my own pieces for relevant. I try to pick out the announcements from uh, from CloudNext that are most relevant to, to this kind of audience. Okay. So please feel free to ask your first question. Okay, cool. And uh, yes, oh, that was all the question. <laughs> Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, uh, let's also mention the hands if you want to ask anything, then uh, please uh, feel free to uh, AMA and uh, point us. Okay, cool. So, just very quickly, uh, this is supposed to be a roadmap that I'm not sure about right now. Due to the brightness, but imagine this to be a roadmap. Um, the, actually, the only important thing for you to know is that we have three cloud texts, and basically there are one in each month. So, we did one in July, and that was uh, Tokyo just recently, actually, London just last week. So what I'm going to do is all the announcement from the three big global uh, cloud next um, events in the last one we have in London. So this basically covers everything. What, what do we actually announce at uh, Google Cloud Next? Well, we do announce basically three things. Um, we announce products that are in alpha, in beta, and products that go to general level availability. So I'm going through all of those three today, and I'm showing you a few things that are launched in alpha, few of the platforms, but also things that can come into, into GA. Okay. Users, users of PCP, you can actually sign up to all of them. And I know some of you might also be part of like um, like other groups like the PCP Insiders that you can work for to teach your customers to have access to those and uh, like automatically, for instance. So I know many of you might even be using some of those. Now, personally, my specialty is, uh, is either DevOps or data. Um, so those are my, my two topics. Data, I'm not really an, an ML specialist, but I know a little bit about how to run ML. So that's what the announcements today I'm going to focus around also in regards to what, what we have here in the audience. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go through announcements that I really can't talk about so much. Like security, for instance, I really know two shadows, so that wouldn't help anyone if I talk about security. Cool. So uh, let's start with this number one. Uh, cloud ML going to Cloud also ML going into the cloud. Um, there was a lot of ML announcements at CloudX, and um, actually it's super hard to pick one of those. Um, I chose Auto ML because that's I think for me the most disruptive if you're already working with, um, um, with machine learning, and it covers a lot of different types of models. Um, so what is Cloud, uh, cloud Auto ML? Just very briefly to, to explain it to you. Um, this is basically uh, pre-trained models, pre-trained machine learning models to move, and then we use transfer learning to apply them to your problems. So you upload your own problem onto GCP, and um, we we learn, we do hyperparameter tuning on the on the cloud using TPUs, um, and then we give you a model that fits your kind of specific problem. So think of it that way. Our, for instance, the cloud vision API, or all of our machine learning APIs that are available, they only have general knowledge. If you show them uh, a human, they just say human. Right. Um, but you could train it on, on your data and it would give you the specific information. That's your grandpa, or that's your cat. We don't allow scanning of face, so maybe I would say it's a cat. So either the normal television model would say it's a cat, and then um, if you train it with your with pictures from your cat, it would say it's me. Uh, or maybe more uh, in the industry context, if you present it some part, it just shows it's a part. Um, but if you upload it, with your parts of the sections is the section sort so of the gearbox. So that's what all that about us. And, us. and we introduced a few new um, features. Um, we introduced Cloud Automal Vision, that's the one I just spoke about, so that's for pictures. But we also introduced a few new very interesting models into into Peter. The first of all is Automal Natural Language. So you know, sometimes you are question that a very particular language. That's not something that a regular um, language model can pick up. Uh, you might use words that are very uncommon. Right? Say, for instance, in medicine or in law, you use an extremely particular terminology for something. And so, a regular text to speech or feature text model might not pick those up correctly or give them the right semantic context and merge them, for instance. So, let's say you're using dialogue flow, which is, a, which is basically an assistant that you can run, right? So, as dialogue flow, um, let's say you're running a hotline uh, where people can call in for some um, medicine kind of issues. Um, then you want that to to, uh, to detect certain words and and maybe merge certain words into certain semantic groups. So you can do that now with AutoML and, um, and train those models. It also works with translation, so the two work kind of like a pair. So let's say you also want them to translate that. You can also 
tell the translation model particular translations that you use. I know, for instance, many enterprises have that. They have an internal translation service, and there would be a dictionary and say, for our company globally, that's the translation we use. Because that's particular that everyone uses the same thing. I come from Europe, so in the EU, for instance, that's very common for legal texts. There's literally a dictionary that says within the EU, this legal term is always translated as that legal term. And that's something we do now with uh, our term. What's also interesting is with data time, again, of course, uh, it's uh, also integrated with human labeling. So, what you can also do is you can actually iterate it. So, it gives you not only the model back, it gives you all of the labels, and now you can have humans look at the errors and actually relabel the errors and therefore improve the model as well, which is a very nice process. So, that's for also now. So that was one, I think, pretty exciting announcement. I don't have any demo here. I have a demo for the next section. But also, it also trains take some time, so it's just, it would just take the, uh, it would just take up too much time. So, then the second one is uh, Cloud Vision API bent into general availability. So, that's now really available to everyone. And what does that do? That does image analysis, so it gives you back um, terminologies, and those are completely pre tagged by you. So, it doesn't know anything about your particular use case, but it tells you a lot about it. Um, what Cloudvision API also supports, and that was announced at, uh, as a beta feature, it can now also recognize products and handwriting. Uh, so it also has a handwriting detection and has a product detection, which is very interesting for companies who want to, for instance, find product handwrites. So you can expect those features also to, at some point, go back into AutoML. So the integration between the Cloudvision API, which is more generic, and AutoML becomes, becomes deeper. So you can train, for instance, an AutoML model on your products to find modifiers. And uh, both of them have a, have a very easy to use REST API. To not bore you too much, we have a little demo on that. Like I said, this one is the least technical talk today. Sorry for that. Uh, but um, yeah, it might just be interesting to do a very quick demo to show you what we need. So this is our Vision API. Uh, you can just actually go to the website, make that a little bit bigger for you, and, um, and upload the image. You can do that even if you're not logged in. You see this is actually. And I'll go to a window. So, instead, you just drag a picture. And so, here, for instance, today we are in uh, April Tree Business City. So, I just drag that in. Cloud API is analyzing the picture. And now it gives me some general information. This is the metropolitan area. Uh, very interesting. It also tells you about the headquarters. I'm not sure that knows that it's a good headquarters, but it's an interesting insight. Um, but um, what's, what's more interesting is now actually um, it gives you information on the internet. Now that's interesting. So it actually knows that it's made for in the city too. Uh, it even finds the architects, DCA architects, who built that building. Um, yeah, and it even finds out with the low confidence, so all the low relevance in this case, um, that it's a uh, that place in Singapore. So that's already pretty interesting information for the fact that it's just coming from the web. It was literally like, like Google Web Search results that it would give to you. But it also has some more interesting properties. For the Vision API, I don't always think about it as specification. So for instance, what's, what's really interesting is it gives you some colors or some hints to say this would be a way to crop your image. So let's say you're building an app and you want people to upload their pictures as an avatar image. So you can use the Vision API to just give you back the bounding box around the face, which might just be interesting. So those kind of use cases have as well. Or you want to say, um, they, would, they should upload their, their picture, and then you want to change the background of your app, or the top avatar image should have the same background color. So you could use the dominant color here to kind of adjust the theme of your app, for instance. That's a fairly, fairly simple use case, right? Uh, right out of the box, to see a little bit of a nicer personalization experience. This is uh, very interesting if you have, for instance, in a corporate environment, something like that, which uploads, you also have the same search. So it will tell you, for instance, and whether it contains any like um, viral issues or medical things. So say for instance you're running um, a support platform for users and users can upload images for the problems they have with your product or something. So you may want to avoid that there's anything uploaded that's not safe um, just because you care about your support users and you don't want to see them like by pictures or something like that. Or even worse. Okay, that was our vision API. Second demo is very quickly is a it's a text-to-speech API. I'm originally German, so I'm going to talk German to it, but so, so you see that it's um, actually um, speaking German as well. 
Hallo, ich freue mich, dass ihr alle hier seid. Okay, so you see it's what my dogs uh, are saying. It's still running, that's why it's still here, and it's just showing it in, in green. But um, now I'm also pasting it into the translation API. That's literally what it was set. Hello, I'm glad that all of you are here. So again, very simple, there's nothing, nothing fancy behind it, but for the fact that you can just use that right now you have on a free API, that's, that's pretty powerful. Right? So there's nothing much behind it, it's just a simple JSON request, you can use that today, um, and use those kind of features to play around with it. And um, just last week, no, actually this week, I got that. I'm just trying to do so much in my new place. Uh, I was at a client who were building something like that themselves, like in a really tiny way, and I was like, well, don't, don't waste the time on that, just, just build it for, um, just call it like that. There's no need for you to actually build that one. Okay, play around with that. As I said, I'm, I'm not even logged in at this stage, so you can just play around with it and, and um, test it. It supports all the languages that um, the translation, the Google Translate support, so you see actually quite a few languages now. Um, especially here in Singapore, by the way, we are I'm working on a lot of um, like second or even third tier languages, so you would see a lot of um, native dialects, for instance, also like in the, in the Indian subcontinent. So I know, for instance, I think recently we added. Um, oops, wait, am I just as good? Okay, yeah, Marathi, for instance, I know someone who was using the API for Marathi. Which is kind of cool because you wouldn't expect that just like, thinking about it. Okay, cool. So let's go back to. Uh, to yeah. Okay, that was a vision API. Yeah. Give me feedback if I'm boring you too much, okay? But I know I'm the first one, so I have the boring advantage. I can step right in, but I think I'll just have to cover for me. Okay, cool. That was a vision API. Yeah. So let's go to the next one. Um, yeah, that's all. Uh, I forgot to say this also can also be used for content moderation. I mentioned it on the side, but imagine safe search the other way around. If you only want to see the pictures that are labels for something like violence or sexual content or something like that, and then want to give them to content uh, moderation moderators. Okay, so because I know there's many startups in here and also people work on apps, I also included Cloud Firestore. So what's Cloud Firestore? Um, Cloud Firestore is basically a mix between Cloud Data Store and Cloud Firestore, and combining all of those parts into, into one. So Cloud Firestore has a document-based ECMO model, okay, rather than an, an entity-based ECMO model, which you used to have a data store. But at the same time, it provides you the real-time updates that you get from Firebase and the offline consistency from Firebase. Because that's, that's always something that people want. So people use Firebase, they love Firebase for all of the features they have regarding real updates, but they also want to have it as a standard backing database of the regular application running on that platform. So this is basically the combination. So now you can have only one database that does both the feeds for real time updates into, into your applications. So you have all of the all of the native libraries on all of the regular um, platforms, including like iPhone and what else? Um, but at the same time, um, you have strong consistency and you have written updates. So you combine the, um, the strengths of um, both of databases. Is that better right now? And um, yeah, check it out. If you're, if you're using mobile applications, it might make your application architecture a lot simpler because you really can only focus on, on one database. Having said that, just to be clear, right, it's still a document based or a collection based database. So if you need something more relational, then, then you might still want to go to Spanner or something like that. But if you have the use case and say, hey, I have a, you know, one of those classic apps that runs on the web, as well as on a, on a mobile platform, you can just use one that is not you don't have to change the condition. Okay, number four, Kubeflow. Has anyone, I saw three data scientists in the audience. Has anyone heard of Kubeflow before? One, okay, two. I actually have someone on my team who is uh, one of the co-promoters of Kubeflow, okay, okay Singapore Engineering. And so that's why that's why I uh, included it here. So it's spread the burden a little more. So um, before I before I go on to the next slide, um, actually no, let's let's go to the next slide. So what is Kubeflow? Kubeflow allows you to deploy your machine learning models onto Kubernetes. It sounds simple, but it's actually not that simple, right? And so Imagine you have, a, you have a model running on TensorFlow, it's actually not that trivial to deploy that onto Kubernetes. Sure, you could just like 
you could just deploy it on like a on like a volume, uh, like a stateful volume, and then just uh, deploy TF serving in, in one container. But it's a little bit clunky, you have to manage all of that. So view flow takes that away from you. You just say I have this model and now run it on that many nodes. So it, it maintains the whole the whole life cycle of the model. Not only that, not only the life cycle of the model in terms of serving and deployment, but also the life cycle of the model for training. So you can say train the model on so and so many nodes, and when you reach a certain accuracy or position, then also deploy it into server. And you can define that all together. That's really nice. It's based on the same way that we use it internally at Google. Internally at Google is called TFX. If you're interested in that, there's a, there's a paper out there that explains this. And even goes one level further, it also includes Jupyter. So it also includes super early model development. So you can have Jupyter running on your Kubernetes cluster and just do some data analysis, you know, just like standard cycle stuff or XG boost or whatever you use. Um, and then you can either choose to deploy that. It doesn't have to be that support. You can also directly deploy it into serving. Um, even if it's a XG boost model or if it's a um, or if it's a cycle burn model. Or you can then translate the TensorFlow and use TensorFlow for serving. So it's just generally much more smoother than the current process where you're somewhere on your, on your local laptop, you have the Jupyter running, you can play around with a small data set, but then it's super clunky and it takes a lot of time to translate it into a different framework and then have it, um, have it served, and then you have to deploy it somewhere. So that's, that's now all a little, a little bit more smooth. Of course, it's all open source and um, yeah, developed by the same people who also work on Kubernetes itself. So they, they also extend Kubernetes about this time. Speaking of Kubernetes, I thought, okay, that's pretty awesome and directly go onto the cloud services platform. The next three announcements are for the cloud services platform. So let me quickly explain what that means. So cloud services platform, to be honest, is a marketing term, it's an umbrella term. The simplest way to explain it is at Google we kind of realized that we have this whole concept of serverless and functions, lambda and so on, like cloud functions. And then we have Kubernetes first. And Kubernetes is more about either batch or just the traditional interactive workloads. But actually it should be the same. Like actually for you as a developer, you shouldn't really care to use one or the other. Theoretically, if your workloads would scale to zero on Kubernetes, then it would be a function. If, it, if there would be some way of auto deploying behind it. So there's no reason why that's not possible. Theoretically, you, you shouldn't care about this. And that's basically what the cloud service platform is. So we 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 wrote addition and we wrote the ecosystem around Kubernetes, and that's all, again, that's all on open source, that allows you to basically run functions on Kubernetes. And that's what the cloud service platform is. Not only functions, but has additional features as well. So this way you can decide whether you want to run batch, or regular like, interactive application, or a function on it. In the end, it's all run by Kubernetes and you can manage them. And then around that, we have many more kind of ecosystem components, and I'm going to go a little bit deeper into, into the details now. But this is basically the way to think about the cloud services platform. So think about, I just want to run my services, and I don't care how it's running. And that's what I'm, and that's what I'm doing. OK, so um, let's start with cloud builds. So like I just said, the, the advantage of a function of a lambda is you just write it, and then it's run. So let's see I see. Right. Well, OK, so what we need to provide you is basically a a zero configuration CI CD service, and that's cloud build. So cloud build provides exactly that, that we, if you update something, automatically run the whole CI CD pipeline, deploy, um, run a canary, and then roll out to different nodes and zones. And use, you know, all of the other features that make it a lot more easy and a lot more flexible. So cloud build has native Docker support, so it generates Docker images to you, does all of that transparently. Um, there is a feature, so you can actually play with it. And what's really nice is you can use it also locally or in the cloud. So it, a, it also breaks this whole barrier from local development. You just want to locally, so, you know, Pesci Hightower always says that, that he's still building local applications. He doesn't have Unicube or Kubernetes running locally. Like that's, that's too much, right? He just want to quickly build something and see how it works. So you can use cloud builds locally, but then scale it into Kubernetes or into GKE. Like, and what I mean with that is like either into Kubernetes on premise or into GKE. And it also has GitHub integration. So we also announced a partnership with GitHub on that. So you can use Cloud Build also as, as just the ICD module on GitHub if you do that. So if you check into GitHub, you can automatically then um, have your CI CD run 
and to, for instance, free or whatever else you want to use for that applications. But that takes this whole pain away that you can't be left um, if you deploy and that you like if you use uh, something like Lambda or other options. So let me have manage this deal. What a manage this deal? Um, so manage this deal addresses the whole traffic and canary aspect that we have with functions. So maintaining all of the rules, and the network rules, the load rules, the resource configuration around, um, around the code. So in case you don't know that Istio is, um, is a program under the Kubernetes umbrella, and it's basically the traffic manager under, under Kubernetes. It allows you to, to manage your connection so you can say service A can talk to service B, or pod A can talk to pod, can talk to pod B. It has um, security, so you can, can define um, for each service, you can, different, you can define different roles. You can say, I can write to the service, but not read to the service. This, um, I, you can do even like um, a content-based authorization. You can, you can do everything you want. You can do content inspection. You can shape the traffic. So for instance, you can say, one service can only have this bandwidth, or can only have um, this type of traffic going to another service. And you can observe all of that. So this here has a really cool API that you can not only get metrics, but actually visualize the metrics in your network. So for instance, if you run Istio on Kubernetes, you can see all of the services and how they communicate, which service ports, which one, how often, and at which times of the day. It's a sort of topological view. So it's a real, um, yeah, it is, it, is, it is a real service platform. And it's developed uh, by this company. I looked in there in the top right corner. So Google, of course, um, but IBM and Red Hat are actually super strong. Um, little known fact, someone told me that last month Red Hat um, succeeded uh, Google as the highest committer to the Kubernetes project. Um, so that's, that's really great that the community is picking up there. Um, and Lyft, Lyft um, contributed um, the proxy, the Istio space on the proxy, basically wraps your service into a sort of sidecar of the proxy, um, and of course, the envoy that comes from Lyft. But then um, the envoy contributed a lot of the networking features, and it's uh, a sort of observability network features into, into this tool. I just spoke about Envoy. This is a little chart how that works. So basically, this is your application, or this is your pod. Uh, sorry, this is your, this is your Docker container. So have, let's say you're building a game, you have a UI for that, and some kind of databases, and this you automatically adds this proxy to you, uh, to your application, and the Envoy proxy. And this way, you can now control exactly which service can talk to which, and you can do service discovery, like real and um, URL based service discovery, not only pod service discovery, which is what and um, Kubernetes does, and you get all of the um, all of the um, observability integration. You can immediately um, ingest all of the metrics into Prometheus without changing anything in the application. You just add it onto Istio, and it, because Istio can now observe all of the network traffic, it automatically um, can all be observed in Grafana or in Stackdriver or, or anything else. And Manage Istio is a part of the cluster platform, so you can now also run directly to the cluster with Istio enabled to look at it. Everything in separate. And then we have Chiki on prem. Chiki on prem is an alpha, and I think we didn't really anticipate such a big interest in Chiki on prem. Not sure, has anyone heard of that? And lots of customers come to us and ask about this. Very interesting. So, Chiki on prem means we run a Kubernetes cluster on your premise. So, why would you want to do that? Well, for instance, if you have private data that you don't want in the cloud, but you want to have a service. That is connected directly. So you want to have, for instance, a service that runs on your native uh, on-premise Kubernetes cluster that deletes all of the PII, but then pushes directly onto the UCP so you can carry the BigQuery. So you can now have these kind of workflows directly end to end. You don't have to do anything. It's fully managed appliance, basically. Um, that's running uh, based on the end So as long as you run Istio somewhere, you can install it and you manage it end to end. And you have a service that uses Istio internally and it's basically uh, a brother and sister cluster, one is in the cloud, one is on premise, so they can talk to each other, do service discovery, traffic shaping, you see everything in Stack Driver, all of those kind of features, and then can extend your application into the cloud. So for all kind of hybrid workloads, that's what um, that's what you can uh, on premise doing. So uh, somehow the font is different. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. So it's all integrated in GCP console. So even though you have your on-premise cluster, you see all the metrics in Stack Driver, you see everything in GCP console, you use IAM permissions from GCP, so you have all of those features available, even though it's actually running on um, on-premise. You can also use um, Cloud Build, of course, 
and you can use um, the, the Cloud Web Pro. Like all those features, can, you can check in your code in the Cloud Web Pro and it will be deployed on one on device. So that's very neat extra uh, kind of feature as part of the Cloud Services platform. So to recap, um, what did I show? I showed Auto now, the Vision API, I showed Firestore, Kubeflow, and as part of the Cloud Services platform, Cloud Builds, Manage this year and GK on Prem. Those are the things that I thought are most interesting. Maybe some of you will be in the audience as well. There are a few more small things that I just want to quickly say. They were not really announced, they were like side announcements, but some of them I think are really cool, so I just wanted to mention them. Um, one is BigQuery and help. I'm not sure if anyone of you has heard of that. So you can now do machine learning directly in BigQuery. So literally, you can write a select statement that runs a model that you define inside the same statement. That's pretty cool. Um, also BigQuery GIS, so you can now, you have um, direct functions in BigQuery to have geographic functions. So let's say you store a latitude and longitude, and you can now have a function that says where um, is my circumference of Singapore. And then you get out of data points that are in Singapore based on only the store latitude and longitude, which is very, which is very cool. And uh, BigQuery data friends service, so connection to other databases. Uh, we also included uh, Cloud Net, so that's network address translation. Sounds like a super basic functionality, right? Um, but actually, it's kind of important and kind of powerful that you can just connect to the outside in a in a managed way, right? So you run one workload on GCE, and now you want to connect to the internet, and you would you want something in the middle that you can control and say, I want to connect to the sport. So the sport is used by clients who have. Um, certain providers who expose certain IP addresses only or certain port numbers and those kind of things, so you can now translate that directly. Um, then we introduced, that's a minor feature, but I'm, I'm using Kubernetes and I'm a level of size, so I kind of like that feature. We use GKE, DSL, D container native book balancing. Who has any idea what that could be? <laughs> yeah, I didn't have any idea either, so I'm going to explain it. So it's very simple. So you know the Google Global Open. That was a global answer. Right okay. feature is a global local answer. Okay? Um, and you can connect that to GKE. That's also awesome. So you have GKE running and you have the DSLV and that seems correct. Now, one problem is that the DSLV does not know which part you're taking because it only knows the command is master. So you lose actually a lot of performance because you might all the time you have to look up the pod first. So you can't have technical connections and you can't have direct connections into pods. You, if you have a cell factor app, it's not so important, you just stateless. But sometimes, like, let's say it's not banking, um, or just even if you have general, like, in finance, HPC kind of applications, very latency sensitive, you actually want to make sure that, that every user always gets the same cost. And that's basically what that is. So you, you don't have to set up your own offer anymore. Now, the Google Global Offerance has this hot awareness. So it goes straight into the white box. And, uh, and that leads to much higher performance. And you don't have to change anything for that. You just use the same Kubernetes application that you use on premise. Zero change. You just deploy it to GKE, and automatically the Google Cloud Cluster has now the awareness of where the service is running in the cluster. And last but not least, I spoke for a stack driver before for Istio to get our two metrics in. What we also introduced, or are introducing the stack driver incident and response management. That's basically a direct bug tracker integration with Sector. So right now the RRT in Sector is a regular RRT, um, and the RRT can send you a page, for instance. But you can't really manage that page. In Sector error report, you can see that, and you can click, um, yeah, I've, I've seen this error, but there is no real workflow around this. So now you can say, if I get an error of this priority, in, notify this group, and one of the group can then um, look at the error and see who that was, and you know, all of the standard incident and response management. Um, okay, that was it. Um, if you want, there's a nice blog post on it too um, that has all of the announcements in there. That's this one here. Under five announcements on Cloud X18. And so let me quickly check. Um, I think I'm 30 minutes in, so I should still have some kind of questions right? Yeah. Awesome, cool. Yeah, so that's what I wanted. So, okay, so we have, I think, 10 minutes maybe? 10 minutes maybe? Or? Okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, uh, that was a very quick run through. So any questions regarding any of the features or anything else actually, you can just make this an AMA. Yes. Yeah, so I can't come to you, I only have a microphone. Actually I could right? Yeah, so I think I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. 
can you talk about some of the use cases that you have already built in? Like, I understand that like, these are pretty technological advancements, but what about the use cases? Like, for example, like in the, one of the examples you talked about the uh, one of the uh, uh, big uh, mansion in of Singapore, but what about cars and all? Like, so I'm talking about insurance and all. If there are accidents and car and cars, can we scan those things also and put it in application? Sure, yeah, we can absolutely. So there's no there's no limitations. It's um, the question like the buying customer product, the question is usually not what the machine learning models can do, right? And the question is rather how good are you in the data? Okay. Uh, how do you figure out that the the, the, the construction was done by a particular company and not so these are basically web search results, right? So basically what's uh, in the example that I shot is the most of the API where I inputted maple tree and then it's official the actual for this thing, right? And this is basically, it's basically Google's knowledge graph, if you like, right? So we figure out, okay, this building is able to do this, and then we look at the knowledge graph, and we look at the opportunity of knowledge graph, and then promise the model with the architect. So we can try it if we have time. I can I can take other questions for us, but I'm very certain that I will put in a picture of your car, <laughs> and then it will tell you the brand of the car. The stuff is made, I think that's better. Yeah. Okay, next one. So, this is someone else first. Okay, cool. Since you're talking about the query uh, that has to be your slide, I'd like to understand uh, how you use the data storage layer and the uh, semantic presentation layer while using the big query. Okay, that's a, that's a very deep question. I didn't know how to talk about that. <laughs> um, I, can, I can give a 30 second overview, okay? So, um, if you want to read about it, there's two seminal papers you want to read. So uh, one is called the Jumbo paper, one is called the Capacitor paper. And basically what, what Jumbo does, uh, Jumbo is a column store, right? Uh, but the trick is that it doesn't store the columns in a columnar format. That's the Capacitor. So uh, basically you have a physical file system and you have a logical file system. So we present it as a logical file system, which is column store. But behind that, we optimize how they are stored across many, many, usually, I don't know, thousands of disks. And the, and the more often you access your data, we, we copy those little mini shards of mini clusters over to as many disks as you can, to as many compute nodes as you can. And that's why we carry this faster than we carry. Because it realizes you, you hit this column more, and so it starts to actually distribute the physical data behind the logical column more. Mm -hmm. Which my usual is that we have the 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 so, do we have any services for that view? Or if I know because it's usually very business specific what you should have by view, you just create a view. The view in BigQuery is just a query that runs in Um Yeah, and you just access that kind of view. One, one, one empty pattern I can tell you is don't use too much JDC um, because BigQuery is inside fast, right? Um, but you're still accessing cloud servers in the network. So, so yeah, we can work on top of the BigQuery. Yeah, it's super easy. So, yeah, as much as you run inside the cloud, it's really the fastest. But don't run your own, uh, don't run your top load on your laptop and then access to query. Uh, because we have a network that we have to call in between, so you do naturally don't get the same points. Thank you. Any else? Yes. Uh, I like this two microphone concept. Um, I actually use the uh, so I just got two questions. Um, what was the difference between Jeff, Alpha, Beta, and GA? Okay, so usually when you release a product, um, if you release that to the public, you can call that GA. So even in many Java products, I'm not sure, for instance, JBoss, if you have the latest JBoss version, that would say 7.0 with 11.11 uh, GA, which means generally available, which means it's basically stable now. Okay? It doesn't mean it's bugged, but it's stable. Uh, a better release is pretty stable, so we think it works, um, but um, it's on your own risk, so we don't provide you any kind of guarantees on that. That's not necessary. And alpha release means as is, good luck. Good luck, that's your point. And 
basically. I hope it's not a good point. Of course, it doesn't blow up. We have good intent, like it will be a stable software, but it might still have bugs, it might have changes, we might change interfaces without an answer that and so on and so forth. Google specific is usually like most of our products on GA have an SLA. That's not the same on all cloud platforms. So basically, if we have a product that's really in, um, in GA, that usually means there's a very clear SLA attached to 